What's up, Giants fans? Back at it with another New York Giants video. And in this video, I want to recap the week one loss to the Minnesota Vikings. And I want to get this out of the way before the show on Wednesday night with Sam because it was very disappointing. Um, I don't want to spend all night Wednesday talking about it when it, it'll be time to talk more about Washington at that point. But this game was just so bad. Um, again, early. The Giants just fell flat, and they never really recovered. Um, you know, nice way to open the drive. Drew Phillips punches the ball out. Defensively, Bobby O recovers the fumble. Giants have to settle for a field goal. Uh, the Vikings go down, and Aaron Jones gets a touchdown late in the first quarter, early second. Sam Darnold looked really good. You know, there was no pass rush whatsoever outside of the one sack from Dexter early on. And Daniel Jones looked atrocious. Uh, I'm going to be straight. Um, you know, losing 28 to 6 in front of all those legends is unacceptable. Um, you know, to kick off the 100th anniversary, I thought the uniforms were really cool. Um, I always thought the Giants should incorporate the red a lot more in their uniforms. So I'm excited they did it for this game. But unfortunately, uh, they didn't look too good playing in them due to the result of this game. And the Minnesota Vikings, I guess you can say, get their revenge from the 2022 playoff game, the wild card loss up in Minnesota. And if you go into the Vikings locker room post game, Kevin O'Connell is saying flat out, we were more prepared than the Giants. He didn't say it that way, but he said we were more prepared. You know, Darnold looked great. Aaron Jones looked great. Harrison Smith with the one interception, that was really good. And then Andrew Van Ginkle with the pick six. And I've always been a guy who has said you never throw the football in the flat. You only throw the ball in the flat if you want to lose a football game and you know Daniel Jones sitting there post game all confused and deer in the headlights saying well I should have threw it quicker I don't know I mean Brian Flores had a phenomenal defensive game plan for the Giants and it's on Daniel Jones Brian Dable it's on everybody Giants didn't do enough in this football game um, abysmal performance nine penalties two for 95 yards the penalties were a huge problem and Daniel Jones, in my opinion, I've been one of the biggest Daniel Jones supporters out there. 2022, big reason to sign him back. I did not like the average per year that he got on his four-year deal, but he's done. 2023, I still held out hope thinking, you know, Daniel Jones was playing with a really bad offensive line. He didn't have a bona fide number one wide receiver. Well, he has that now, and I don't know what it is if – I think it's a combination of two things. Jones's confidence is shot. He doesn't have it anymore from back in 2022. And his ACL, coming off the ACL. I mean, you know, he ran well, but decision-wise, he's looking like Carson Wentz from a couple of years ago. And that's very concerning. Um, 22 of 42, 20 incompletions is a lot. A lot of the passes were short-hopped. 186 yards, no touchdowns, and two picks. He was sacked five times. Four of those were self-inflicted sacks, um, in my opinion, and the stats back it up. Only one was surrendered by the offensive line. Six rushes for 15 yards. Now, we want to go deeper into this performance of Daniel Jones. According to Next Gen Stats, he had 2.82 seconds to throw the football. That was the 12th best among starting quarterbacks in week one. Malik Neighbors averaged just under four yards of separation, eighth best among wide receivers. Um, so pardon me, let me discredit that four number against Jones. Three of the five sacks were credited to Daniel Jones. Um, but yeah, it was just abysmal. They couldn't get the running game going with Devin Singletary, 10 rushes for 37 yards. Uh, Malik Neighbors had five catches for 66 yards, not bad for him. Um, you know, going in with high expectations. I like that he honored Ray Flaherty and his family, um, having a picture of him on his shirt uh, pregame. But again, you don't do well on first down. You're going to get to second and long, third and long, and that minimizes your game plan. That minimizes your playbook, and it's not acceptable. You know, you can look and say, oh, Wandale had six catches for 44 yards. That's not a lot of yards because most of the throws are short, and he had 12 targets. That's on Daniel Jones. Darius Slayton, three catches for 26 yards. He's in concussion protocol, not good. The rookie tight end, Theo Johnson, had one catch for 18 yards, but he also had one costly drop. Now, 
looking at third down, the Giants weren't bad on third down. They were actually pretty good, 7 of 18 on third down. However, way too many third downs. Uh, just 240 total yards of offense, two turnovers, 0 for 3 in the red zone. The one bright spot of the Giants' offense outside of Malik Neighbors was the offensive line. Andrew Thomas had a 91.4 pass blocking grade, gave up no pressures, hits, or hurries at all. He was perfect. Uh, John Runyon gave up the only sack on the offensive line along with the pressure. Um, not bad numbers from him. John Michael Schmitz gave up one hurry and one pressure. Greg Van Roten was the worst one, but again, these numbers are not terrible. Uh, gave up four pressures and two hits. You know, you want to see better, but Greg Van Roten's been with the team out of the five starters the shortest amount of time. And then Jermaine Illuminor, who I thought was pretty solid. Three pressures, two hurries, and a hit. So just 10 total pressures surrendered by the Giants starting offensive line. And let's be realistic here. You're going up against Dallas Turner, Jonathan Grenard, Andrew Van Ginkle, Harrison Phillips. I mean, this Vikings front is probably the only strong suit of their defense. I think their linebackers are average to below average. Um, you know, Ivan Pace was solid. He was talking a lot of trash, but the secondary is not great, and the Giants just couldn't attack it like the way Daniel Jones did in the 2022 playoff game. Um, defensively, the Giants were not good. Um, Micah McFadden did not play. He was listed as active, but – he didn't really get in the game, and that was definitely a problem. Um, Aaron Jones averaged six and a half yards per carry, 94 rushing yards on just 14 carries and a touchdown. Um, it was really, really abysmal. And then Brian Burns and Kayvon Thibodeau were non-existent in this game. They did not pressure Sam Darnold at all. And then they got very defensive with the media um, after the game. I think it was Jordan Redon was asking Thibodeau a question, and um, – he said something like next question. And then Jordan was a little puzzled saying, what is that a bad question? He was asking something about how, you know, a lot of money is invested into your defensive line. You guys really couldn't get it going today. What was the issue? What was Minnesota doing? And Th Thibodeau, I thought rudely cut him off and just, you know, he was acting like a hot guy. And I don't really appreciate that coming from a guy who is supposed to be developing into a leader entering year three for Big Blue. I did not like what I saw from Kayvon Thibodeau. Dexter Lawrence, I thought his response wasn't as bad. It's just the way he worded it was terribly. Um, the one question that was asked to him wasn't the best question, but I thought Dexter Lawrence had the only good game out of the big three on that defensive front. Um, you know, Brian Burns, very hit or miss player, eight sacks last year with the Panthers. Um, Deontay Banks struggled too. He had one tackle for loss. I thought he didn't have a bad game, but he did give up that touchdown on the slant to Justin Jefferson. That is a difficult play to guard. Um, Dory Jackson called for that bullshit pass interference call, which I disagreed with. I didn't think he was awful. Um, I will say, though, there were some young players on this defense that, that shined, and I think all three rookies who got action on Sunday played well. Tyler Newbin had seven tackles, making plays in the backfield. Darius Musau, six tackles, one for loss, had a pass deflection and an interception um, in his first NFL start. You know, he started for McFadden due to McFadden's injury. And then Drew Phillips, of course, forced a fumble. I thought he what happens um, special teams-wise. The Giants also were without Gunnar Olszewski. He re-aggravated his groin. In pregame warm-ups, Slayton returned one punt. Eric Ray returned one kick. Those were the Giants' backup options. And, guys, they only carried 51 players on game day. There were two open spots. So, definitely an interesting selection there by Coach Debo and Joe Shane. Uh, the Giants elevated linebackers Carter Coughlin and Ty Summers to play special teams. Carter Coughlin tore his pec early in this game. He's going to miss months. Could be out for the season. Um, Gano hit two field goals, the only points, and Jamie Gillen down four of his six punts inside the 20-yard line. So overall, very respectable day for new special teams coordinator Michael Gobriel. He was put in a lot of interesting situations, and I thought he handled it very, very well. Um, but yeah, speaking of special teams, I mean, that's going to be it for the game recap. The Giants also sort of lost Nick McLeod week to week, who I thought had an awful performance in the first half. 
against Minnesota. He single-handedly allowed that Aaron Jones touchdown, um, you know, the counter play to the left side of the line, and then Darius Slayton's in concussion protocol. So McLeod, a guy who's typically a special teams guy, starting a corner, it's it's definitely a problem. Um, and one more thing before I address the uh, new kick returner situation. I did not love this look for Giants fans, heckling Daniel Jones post-game. Um, I understand why they did it. Um, I respect their right to voice their opinion, but they waited for like an hour. And, you know, Daniel Jones is already not confident in himself. Why go at this guy even more when you have a game next week at Washington? Um, I guess Giants fans really just don't like Daniel Jones on a personal level, and it's sad. It is very sad, and it's disgusting in my opinion. But um, fans have the right to boo. Fans have the right to get mad, especially at their quarterback when you lose. And Daniel Jones is the second highest paid player on the team. Behind, actually, no, he is the highest paid player on the team in front of Brian Burns. So, yeah, it, it's not it's not a good look at all to throw two picks and look lifeless in your first game of the season coming off the injury. And I do feel bad for Daniel Jones. There was a video that went viral. One of our guests on Big Blue Avenue last year actually filmed it, Sarah McCrory, of fans burning Daniel Jones' jerseys in the parking lot. That's way too far. I have no time and respect for that. But the heckling post game of them coming out of the private player's exit, yeah, um, security might have to up that in the future. Uh, you know, definitely want to support Daniel Jones, but, you know, I think he's bad. He's done. Anything good he did in 2022 is now gone. Um, there's no excuses this year. Offensive line, wide receivers, I said it, and I'm going to stick to it. Um, he does have a chance to redeem himself next week at Washington, but um, if he doesn't play well, Brian Dable may have to toy with the idea of benching him. All right. So, with Gunnar Olszewski out, the Giants went ahead and signed a new return specialist, Amir Smith-Marset, from the Carolina Panthers last season. He returned 37 punts and one touchdown for them, played in all 17 games. He also had eight catches last season on 10 targets. He didn't return any kicks, and last year was his first year returning punts, but this is probably the second-best option. And We know Joe Shane and Dan Morgan are buddies. They help each other out, and... Smith Marset is a local kid, grew up in Newark, New Jersey, born and raised. He's 25 years old. Um, he spent time with the Bears, the Chiefs, and the Panthers last year, last couple years. And you know, the Vikings picked him out of Iowa, 2021 fifth round pick. He had two touchdown catches as a, as a rookie. So there is some upside there on just five catches that season. So he could be a potential big play threat. Um, or just a pure special teams returner. The Giants definitely need it. We don't want Eric Gray doing kick and punt returning. We saw how that script went last year. And Slayton, who did return one punt, is in a concussion protocol. So Smith Marset is the newest member of the 53-man roster. Uh, Giants, other moves. They also brought back Curtis Bolton to the practice squad. Uh, and they brought back Jakob Johnson to the 53-man roster. And most notably, Giants signed guard Cade Mays to the practice squad and terminated offensive tackle Marcellus Johnson. Now, Cade Mays, completely new to the team. Let's talk about him. Uh, 2022, sixth-round pick by the Carolina Panthers. Uh, played the last two seasons with them. He started seven career NFL games, two in 2022, and five last season. He's a big hog, 6'6", 325. And he's 25 years old. I definitely think he's an upgrade over Marcellus Johnson. Surprising that he was available. Uh, but yeah, he has seven NFL starts to his name. And to have that on the practice squad, that's not a bad thing. You know, Greg Van Roten is 34 years old. He gave up uh, a lot of pressures last week. We don't know if he's going to hold. The Giants might not be too confident in Josh Azudu. We know that Austin Schlotman is on IR. Evan Neal has had health issues and he's had trouble getting his footing. And then Jay Kubis is an undrafted rookie who's an unknown. So you want to add veteran experience in the backup uh, O-line position unit as well, even if it's on the practice squad. And maybe they look to elevate Cade Mays next week. Who knows? He has starting experience, so I wouldn't be surprised if he's one of the two Giants elevations. So 
With that being said, that's my recap on week one and brief preview into the week ahead as week two transactions continue to take place and sort. Folks, please, if you're new, make sure to check us out on all of our social media platforms on Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube at Big Blue Avenue. Make sure to smash that like button, ring the bell for notifications, give us a thumbs up. Appreciate you all. And guys, it's just one week. Stay calm. I know it's tough, but who knows what can happen in week two. Folks, without further ado, let's go Big Blue.